Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Jim Simonetti to speak with PJ Core and Graham Diamond. Welcome back to the show guys. Thanks Paul. Thank you. Thanks Paul. We had a fantastic conversation PJ with yourself in relation to the remarkable work you've done over in Cambodia and you mentioned a certain Graham Diamond during that dialogue and we've had Graham on for his own Celtic State of Mind episode which was tremendously entertaining and interesting so we decided we'd get the pair of you together to talk about your second Cambodian trip because you showed us a short video Jim and I watched it and it was heartbreaking it was emotional it was uplifting it was all of these emotions and uh, it'd be great to hear a wee bit more but I think the the roots of this second part go back to Graham and your relationship with Jim Simonetti could you tell us could you take us back to how you know Jim and how that What's in the favour of PJ when it came to go to Cambodia? Yeah, I first met Jim oh, many years ago. In fact, it, um, it was Jim's sister that I knew first of all, Margaret. Margaret and I worked in um, a pub called Century 54. I was a DJ there and Margaret was uh, one of the waitresses. And I got to know Margaret well and... Um, from that, um, she'd mentioned Jim, but I'd never met him. And she'd mentioned he was into football. And it was one day, I was doing a coach education course for the SAFA at uh, St. Morris's High School in Cumbernauld. And uh, Jim just happened to be on the course, and I saw the name Simonetti. And it's not your, your normal uh, name, as you can imagine. And I happened to say to him, do you have a, a sister called Margaret? And and it, it just went from there, and... Uh, we, we struck up a, a, a relationship then and we'd kept in touch um, through different various things and became uh, very good friends. And the, 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 the thing with regards to um, Cambodia was that we'd already, PG and I had previously been out with Celtic the, the previous year and he's no doubt um, told you all about that. And after the, after the visiting the place where, where where the kids were staying and the the one hour journey back in, in the minibus uh, which was so emotional and heartbreaking that you know not one person said a word on the way back and it was it was really soul searching at, at that point and uh, we made a, a vow um that we wanted to help in some way we could and, and that we would come back and, and do something. So although it was great um, great thoughts and great plans, uh, the logistics of it were extremely difficult um, in reality. So when we came back, we, 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 we thought, what are we going to do? And PJ had spoken about um, doing a football drive and he would do it through, through his school and his school kids. Uh, and I said, OK, we'll try, I'll try and... Um, uh, arrange a trip and see what it would be and we would maybe speak to Celtic to see if they'd be interested in coming on board and uh, we would get back out and um, just get over the, the following year just to revisit the places that we'd been to and um, take over kit with regards to football boots, trainers um, strips and whatnot to, to give away to, to the, the kids there. So uh, as we really then started to get into the nitty gritty, uh, we found that um, it wasn't just as easy as we, we had thought. The logistics of it were um, one, it was extremely expensive. Two, it was um, extremely difficult for to to get kit in. Not so much to get the kit in, for to get the kit transferred over to um, Cambodia. Um, we hadn't really thought of that because we were looking at roughly. 40, 40 bags, and if you can imagine 40 extra bags going on a, a, a flight, how much that would then cost, never mind the, the cost of the flight and your, your your accommodation. Whereas when we went over with Celtic the year before, that was all taken care of, so we, you know, we, didn't, we didn't see it, but we're actually now doing this on our own, so we're having to pick up uh, any costs associated with it. But we were determined that we would give it a go no matter what. So PJ started on his kit drive of the school. It was going really, really well. And then I started looking at costs of flights and uh, accommodation and how much it would be for to actually get the kit over. Um, and then we found out it was, it was extremely expensive. So at that point, 
it was still uh, an aspiration, um, and we hadn't we hadn't actually firmed anything up. And I just happened to bump into um, Jim. I can't even remember where it was because we, we met we, we met up uh, uh, quite a lot. What I would maybe go down and watch uh, Jimmy Johnson Academy playing down at Cathkin, and Jim would be there, and I'd, ha- I'd have a cup of tea with him and a wee chat, or whatever. And although we, um, it's one of these relationships that. I maybe not see Jim for a year, two, three years, whatever, but it's as if I, I was with him yesterday. So it's that, it's that type of relationship. And I just happened to be down, and was down at Cathkin watching Jimmy Johnson Academy play, as I say, and uh, Jim said, what's happening, this, that, the next thing. And I started to tell him about what we were planning for for Cambodia. And uh, he, he started to listen to us and, and, and take it on board. And he says, that's, that's absolutely fantastic what, what you're trying to do. And I said, aye, aye, it is. Um, I said, we're really looking forward to it. And that was it. And nothing nothing more than that. And then the following day, uh, I get a phone call from Jim um, who said that uh, the Jimmy Johnston Charitable Trust would like to sponsor your trip out to Cambodia because we think what you're doing fits in absolutely 100% to the ethos of a Jimmy Johnston Charitable Foundation. And I said, wow, oh, that's great, Jim. Thank, thanks very much. He says, eh, what are you needing? And I'm thinking, well, maybe a set of bibs or something like that, or maybe a, 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 a couple of old strips. Um, and he said, he says, no, uh, what have we still got to do? And I says, well... PJ's organised all, all the kit. I says, I need to get that over. I says, I've spoken to the Emirates and they're, they're, they're looking for an arm and a leg for to get the, the, the kit over. It's going to cost us a fortune. I says, I never realised how expensive the actual flights were because we never paid for them last year. Didn't know how much the flights were. And I says, then we've got accommodation. And I says, and then once we're there, we're, we're going to have to try and organise people that we know over there to pick us up and take us to all these different places that we want to go to to distribute the kit. And... Uh, he said, eh, listen, he says, eh, we, as in Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust, will cover the costs of your flights and your accommodation. Well, you could have knocked me down with a feather when he said that. And, and you know, and if it wasn't for the fact that Jim said that, I'd have said, you're winding me up here. But being the man that he is and the man that I know he is, I knew he was absolutely genuine about it. And he cared, and he cared as much as we did, having experienced the actual being there. But he wanted to do it in the name of Jimmy. And um, I remember PJ telling me that he was at pains to stress to him that when we do go out there, that we'll be representing the name of Jimmy Johnston. And uh, as uh, even though we were well aware of it, that was the only caveat that he put on on anything now we know fine we know full well um, about the association with Jim Johnson throughout the world and particularly the charitable trust that just been set up and being massive Celtic fans ourselves there was absolutely no way that that wouldn't be the case no matter what so when, when Jim came up with that offer of paying I says, I says listen do you know how much that will actually cost no it doesn't matter. Book it. Book the flights. Book your accommodation. We'll sponsor it. Well, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So at that point, I phoned PJ and told him what Jim had offered. Um, I then says, well, it's, just, it's fantastic. It's a goer. We're, we're definitely going to go now. We've got it it's sorted. I said, the only thing we need to work, uh, look at is getting the kit over to Cambodia, over to Phnom Penh rather, and then we can pick it up and distribute from there. And uh, uh, we thought, right, how's that going to happen? Well, when we were there the previous year, uh, we'd met um, the deputy British ambassador, a guy called Cash Gleason, who was a big West Ham supporter, and I remember PJ told you about that yesterday. And he... Yeah, a lovely guy, lovely guy. Uh, so down to earth, it was unbelievable. So we were doing all these kind of TV 
um, interviews and whatever. And he was at one of the press conferences where we actually presented him with a Celtic jersey with Gleason in the back and whatever. And he was absolutely bowled over and, 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 and couldn't believe we'd done this. So he said to us, Any, anytime if you're needing anything, just let us know. You know, one of the ones. When you go on holiday and you meet the, the couple for, <laughs> for Leamington Spa and you say, yeah, well, next time we're up in Glasgow, just give us a shout and we're there. So it was one of the ones. So what happened then was PJ was actually still keeping in touch with Cash because he's that sort of guy. Um, and he happened to mention to Cash that we were coming back over. Um, and we're, st- we're just looking at the, the, the logistics of getting the kit over. To which Cash then uh, made us an offer of if we could get the stuff going down to to London, then he would arrange for his diplomatic diplomatic jet, yeah, yep. diplomatic jet to take the stuff over. And we went, no, no way. And he says, I way. So that was it. So then we thought, well, how are we going to get this stuff down to, to London? So. As we're keeping in touch with Jim, we're saying, oh, we'll get everything sorted. We can't believe how, what what a, a, an offer you've made us to go over there. It's going to be, make so much of a difference. And he uh, says, we just need to think about, we've got the, the, the diplomatic plane now going to Phnom Penh. And we just need to get the stuff down there. And Jim being Jim, without blinking, says, I'll take it then. I'll get a van and I'll take it then. Well... Not only did the sponsor us going over through the Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust, he actually drove all the kit bags, put them in the van. PJ delivered them in two or three runs down to Tory Glen. Jim had arranged for a van to to uh, get the stuff put into and drove the kit all the way down to can't remember what it was, just outside just London outside. or something like that. But you had to have all this paperwork, diplomatic paperwork. So that's PJ's bag. So uh, he had to do something. So he then um, <laughs> he then sorted the paperwork out and uh, I think he was having kittens about the fact that if, it, if anything went wrong, then the whole thing was up in the air. But fortunately, the paperwork was fine. Jim dispatched the stuff down and they came back up the road and let us know that's it sorted and it's away. Uh, or it's on. It's ready for on the plane to go to Phnom Penh. Uh, I then got the the, the flight sorted and the uh, hotel, and um, Jim uh, paid for it through the Jim Johnson Charitable Trust. And I'll never, we will never be able to thank him enough or repay the faith he had in us, just because he felt that the the story of which we we had um, told him fitted perfectly into the ethos of Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust and it's an honour and privilege that we were able to do that in his name Jim just thinking back to that you've you've bumped into an old pal what was it about the the Cambodian trip that captured your Im- imagination um poverty poverty um First of all, it was very kind words, eh, 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 Graham and, and, and PJ, obviously, eh, what, what, what they're saying. Um, poverty. Um, I grew up in poverty. Um, well, we all grew up in poverty where, where I lived, and it was very, 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 very difficult um, eh, to make ends meet. But when you grow up in that kind of uh, environment, actually makes you a stronger character and it makes you understand if you do you become fortunate in life and you manage to do things it's a wee bit successful and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate that life's been good to me as well on various things that I've done but and listen to the story for the guys that touched me the poverty part touched me uh, anything to do with kids and to help them uh, would have been very important to Jimmy, first and foremost. And Jimmy was a kind man, uh, and he, he he done lots of things to help. He, he did different 
the different people along the way. But he never shouted he, from the, the 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 high hills that he's done this and he's done that. And that's not what we, we, we want to do either. And this is not what we're doing here. Um, uh, what we do, we do it we do privately. And the guys wanted to speak about this and that's why we're along today to speak about it. And we don't ask people for money, we don't ask people for donations or whatever, we've never done that. But Jimmy Johnson uh, said to me that, um, he said, uh, what I would like you to understand, Simmy, is that um, when you're at the table, I'm at the table with you. So if you make a decision, and it's in the name of Jimmy Johnson, no matter what, I'll back you to the help, even when I'm not there. I will be there. So I think, I think he, when I heard the story, maybe the, maybe the spirit of Jimmy Johnson heard the story as well, and uh, uh, and we wanted to help. That's why there was no, what about this, what about that, what about that? Yes, it was instant. Right, well, that's something we want to do. And, and that's what we do with various other things as well. And um, as I say, we're very quiet. We go about our business very quietly, Paul. And um, uh, that was a very, very important one. And when the guys he, he came back, I mean, we didn't even ask them, what did you do? What did you do here? What did you do there? We just knew, and uh, Graham touched on it as well, that, um, <laughs> that the, the only stipulation to PJ and to Graham was, now listen, remember, you represent Jimmy Johnson. You represent Jimmy Johnson. So that's all we want you to do. And do it. And do it in a way that you feel fit to represent Jimmy Johnson. So I think we, we, that part of it was very, very important. That was it. That was it. We're not looking for any, we weren't looking for anything back. We weren't looking for anything, uh, accolades or whatever. Just and the guys come back and said, "There's the kids get this and that, brilliant job done." End of story. But he 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 getting the kit, get the kit and all that down to London. The, the guys obviously it was going to take six months to sail it out, and it was going to take this time and and whatever. And then between the diplomat and a few other different things that were spoke about PJ, we managed to get it sorted, Graham. So myself and a, a wee guy called Martin McKenna. Uh, Decided that the him, him and I decided that we're going to take it. Then actually, my sister used to pick him up in the morning. He thought he was going for a wee walk around Loch Lomond. <laughs> and uh, I've known Martin since school. And he jumped in the water. It's great, Simmy. You know I said, right, Martin. He said, where are we going? I said, we're going to London. <laughs> so, anyways, we're doing by Bryce Norton or something around that way. Yeah. And um, we get stood. Actually, and I go back, I've got to mention this guy. So, we've got all this kit in the back. And I remember, I said, I know a guy that might have me a kit. So I went by Gino. Gino. I went by a, 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 a Gino. I phoned him up and he said, oh, Yeah, Jimmy, I'll, I'll be able to help you with all the different kit. Well, he does stuff for a lot of the big bands and all that. And he, 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 Bobby Plant, Robert Plant, he does stuff for him and whatever. So he gave me all this kit as well. Didn't th- he thought it was going to come down a couple of days later, but I went by Birmingham, picked all that kit up, got done. Uh, PG, where are you? Texting me. I'm such and such for he. So he's making kittens regarding the paperwork because it was a it was a situation where that they wouldn't confirm that you were okay to go, but we went anyway. They, they didn't confirm, so we got there. So anyway, we get there and we get to the station, uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, air uh, air base, and uh, we get in. Anyway, cut cut the story short. Long he cut he cut, uh, cut cut the story a wee bit shorter here. So we get in, but Martin is sitting outside. So I gets through with the van, and anyway, these soldiers know that are all running about, and we opens up the back of the so they, they search the van, and uh, they say right, you've got everything in a a, a, a D a DB dipl- diplomatic bag. I'm going, no, no, we just got them all in the bags. So nothing's got to be in. So they, they open the back of the van, and there's all these Celtic strips all hanging out of the back of the van. And this one soldier says, "There's, there's Celtic taps." 
Ja, Celtic Tubs. I'll not say what he said, but anyway, because we're on here. Right, they're all gone. He said, look, but nothing's bagged. He says, excuse me, mate, but where, where have I saw this to go? I said, no, it's all organised. It's all organised. And so on the paperwork. Anyway, we eventually got it sorted and uh, all the guys uh, uh, put it on the plane and away it went. And obviously the kids at our side received all the... All the uh, or, or, the, or the kit but I've got to say something hey guys it wasn't just he, he, Jimmy Johnson he, Jim, Jimmy Johnson played a wee part of the story yeah, they played a wee part of the story yeah, the, you know the, the biggest part of, of, of this story as well is the kindness uh, for the people of Glasgow especially the kids you know Glasgow's a Glasgow's a fantastic place whether you support Celtic, whether you support Rangers, or whoever you support, but see, see when it all comes to get something, all to come together, they all want to help. So all the kids that and their parents that pull everything together for PJ, they're all part of this story that we don't know their names. And you know, I kind of get to see we girl in the video that then you have, uh, then you have the uh, the boots, then you have the boots to play football. Or to play sport, who was the person that put those boots in the bag for her to get the other side of the world? So there's the magic of Jimmy again helping that be part, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted the guys went. But uh, and hopefully, hopefully we can do it again. That would be remarkable. I mean, as you say, the magic of Jimmy, but you know. You're on a diplomat's jet with all this kit that had been handed in <laughs> from the good people of Glasgow and elsewhere. Once you touch down at the other end, talk us about your second trip over in Cambodia. Um, yeah, obviously, if you'd seen us on the plane, um, we were like excited schoolboys again because all of a sudden we'd been planning and talking about what can we do and all these things started coming together. And before you know it, we're on the plane again. Like, this is incredible. And we've got the, and Graham will tell you, get the, the Jimmy Johnston uh, polo shirts on. And, you know, Graham had the privilege of wearing that before. But I remember when, when Jim gave me that, you're sitting thinking, and he did instill that message. You know, you're representing Jimmy Johnston. I was like a kid. I was like, I was so proud. You know, I wanted everyone to see this badge and I wanted everyone to ask questions. I just wanted everyone, I was so proud that that's who we were there representing. You did feel a wee bit nervous as well because you, you wanted to do him justice and you wanted to do Jim justice and you wanted to do the, the Academy and the Charitable Trust justice. But we were going over on the plane and we were so excited again. Uh, they lost my luggage, <laughs> they lost mine, but uh, they kept Graham's. So we kind of landed and um, uh, a friend of ours that we'd met the last time had arranged a kind of taxi idea to pick us up to collect us. And um, so this guy didn't speak a word of English. And um, so we're sitting in the car and he is, they drive like lunatics over there. Like there, there's no lanes, there's no, they just drive like lunatics. And that's just completely normal to them. So he was having a, a massive argument with somebody on the phone about something. <laughs> we are sitting in the back, the car's getting like crazy. He passed us a wee mobile phone. Uh, we had no idea what it was for. So we just kind of kept, it was like something that a Liam Neeson film. But eventually we got to the accommodation that, that Graham had arranged. Um, it'll be the last time that Graham arranges accommodation for us. <laughs> but uh, we arrived at the accommodation and um, we, were, we were right back out the next day because um, the way we, we'd only stay there, I think we were just under 10 days. So every day was kind of packed with something. And the first kind of group of kids we went out with was, um, it was a, a government charitable organisation that, um, that Andy actually had worked with. So we're out, we're, we ran a great session, you know, the, the kids were brilliant, it was, just, it was all about fun, you know, it was just about fun, and um, and obviously kind of getting bits of the kit out and stuff, and there was a few kids that had a, kind of few kind of anger issues and kind of things like that, but as kids sometimes that happens, it's a passionate game, and so we probably had done about an hour and a half, whatever, and the kids were having a wee kick about at the end, and one of the coaches came up and basically said, oh, so, you know, a lot of these kids come from poor backgrounds and stuff, and and then he was starting to say, and he says, every single one of these kids that you've coached today has been abused in some form. Whether it's sexual abuse, mental abuse, whether they've been sold for abuse by their parents, um, 
which sounds awful, but, and it is awful, but a lot of these parents don't know any better and they, and they don't know how to get money for their families, but this is part of educating these families, etc. And it was it was probably similar to when we had the wind knocked out ourselves that first time when we spoke to you kind of visiting the graveyard where where a lot of the young people and the families lived. It was another moment where it just it just hit you and it's like no wonder those two wee kids had, had anger issues and were, and were lashing out, you know, no wonder. And it and it was just it was an instant reality check almost from this this is why we're back here, you know, we're we're just trying to help. We're just trying to get kids having fun and who have obviously not experienced a lot of fun and have experienced a lot of things that the majority of people will just never have to experience in their life. And um, so so that was a touching moment day one, right off the bat, and a really stark reminder as to why we were kind of back there. Um, and then we kind of went from there. We went up to the Indochina Starfish Foundation again, who Vicheka Chop, who, who kind of runs the school out there. And we'd had a two, I think it was a three day programme we'd kind of set up with her. It, it was fantastic. Now, like we said, that school runs, um, the whole programme's based on football and it's based on feeding the local kids, even if they don't go to the school. And we ran everything. So we were in the classrooms and we were doing English lessons. Uh, luckily, we had Simone who came along with us and did the, the translating part of us, but we were doing English speaking lessons. So splint the groups and you're asking about geography and they're asking about your family and, and that type of thing. Then it was the, the dancing lessons. Yeah, if you ever seen Graham on the dance floor, you know you can move. So he took it upon himself to teach the, the Cambodians the slosh. So we're doing a bit of that. <laughs> uh, the PE teacher bit came out of me and I started teaching the Cayley dancing, the Scottish Cayley dancing. We had a bit of that. And then um, Graham was delivering the coach education for the coaches. And if, if you know Graham, it's his expertise. Outstanding, outstanding coach, outstanding coach educator. Um and that was brilliant. So you're educating these teachers slash coaches who are delivering a lot of sessions for the young people, and and that that was just fantastic. And each night we would go back with our tuk tuk driver that kind of took us out, tiny wee tuk tuk, and it's full of kit and everything, and all the rest of it that we are trying to get back and forth. And we didn't actually hand it out to to those to the the group of kids there. We kind of snuck it in to avoid a, a kind of avalanche of kids, as you can imagine, trying to get a, a jersey. But what kind of sticks out and having chatted to Vicheka and, and stuff is a lot of the kids there don't didn't have shoes. So that was that's what they're really short of. No sandals, anything like that. So they're walking for miles and dirt tracks to get to school, just to get an education, just to have a chance. And they're really pushing and teaching these kids English because it's the best way for them to get a job. Big push on, on getting young females educated and, and into university because it's still very much viewed in Cambodian society females are there to get married and, and raise the family so the big she's very big in kind of empowering the young women in that which is fantastic and it was um, probably just to touch in on the story that that, um, that Jim touched on there we, we went out to one of the schools that Indochina support but it's more a, a kind of a public school and um, this is the kind of story that we probably refer to as our kind of Cinderella story and it was our our, our, it was our last visit to one of the schools and we've had the last couple of bags of kit full of strips and just a kind of couple of wee bits and pieces that were left and you we showed you guys the video the other day you know if you try and picture it you know a lot of our young people might complain about playing in grass or the pitch is too small or their pitch consisted of rocks dry sandy dirt uh, that long sharp grass that comes up to your knees and that was all in the same pitch didn't stop them. They they trained so hard, like running and standing and all sorts, desperately just just loving football, as, as same as the kids do over here. You know, no difference. And this um, this wee girl caught her eyes. Um, she was a tiny wee thing. She was probably about five or six at most. And here she was training with the older girls, and she was training so hard, so hard, but didn't have any shoes on. And this actually, we were trying to chat to the coach with a wee bit of chat that we could get going with them. And she wasn't allowed to play in the end game because they didn't have a pair of boots and they were all older, etc. But she trained so hard and we just sat there. And you can actually see Graham watching in the clip and he turns out the camera and just goes, wow. Because she's just one of those players that just inspires you. And we were looking, we are looking, I thought, oh, we need to go check the bag here. And it, by magic, there was one pair of football boots left in the bag and they were the totiest weave pair of football boots you've ever seen. You're sitting thinking, 
please, please just let let these fit. And um, so we kind of signaled to the coach, didn't we? And we called her over and we kind of sat down and we're looking at these wee pair of boots and you think this just might. And that's what we talk about the Cinderella moment, wasn't it? She just kind of put her foot out and we slid this boot on and it just fitted perfect. And she was very shy, very nervous, but this kind of smile and she's kind of looking at you, looking at the boots as if, you know, these are for me, these, these are your boots, these are for you. You know, somebody way back in Glasgow has, has sent these boots out for you. Um, so there we go and we're tying up the laces, aren't we? And we're tying it up and before you know it, she's standing there with this pair of football boots. Graham, straight away to the coach, he's like that. He's pointing, you know, to the, you know, she's got boots, she's got boots on now, and, and he waves on, 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 and she's kind of looking about, and a wee gentle shove, and there she was. She Brilliant. before her own eyes, we're watching her run into this game, and she's playing. Now it's a regret that we we didn't actually. This is one of the things that we didn't actually film or take a picture of, but it's just solely because we were just so in that moment, and it was it, probably like being a parent, but it, it was just that moment. And you're just watching her and you're just sitting back thinking, if this was the only thing that we did all this for to come over here for this moment, it was worth it. It was worth everything just for that one moment. And she nearly scored. She hit a shot that just went by the post. I think we were a pitch invasion. We were up on our feet. We were nearly there. But see, just to see her running about with this pair of boots. And obviously she's running weird at first because she's never had a pair of boots. And that moment is, I think that's why we call it the Cinderella story. And then what makes it even better, we, can, uh, we said to, to Jim, one of the big reasons that when we were talking about doing this all from the start was, and involving the kids in it, is we wanted the kids to see the whole picture. You know, not just, it, it's good to help other people and, it, and it's good to help charity because sometimes, and we're all guilty of that, we do that and then we maybe forget about it that we've done it. But we, we wanted the kids to see the impact of it. Okay, so this is what you've done. This is what you've delivered. And here's the pictures. Here's the videos. Look at the smiles. You've done that. One act of kindness. You've done that. And it turned out that when we went back, the family that we're close with, and we spoke about the former pupil, Rebecca Hill, it was actually her wee sister turned around and she says, that was my pair of football boots. Fantastic. <laughs> and it was like the, the, that was the Cinderella story complete. And um, it was incredible, and you see that's why we've got that picture. And and actually, when we're handing out the strips at the end, and you saw that video yesterday, the wee girl end up with the wee Scotland strip. So if you've ever seen any pictures from our trip, it's the wee girl with the, the Scotland strip, and it's a wee kind of grey and, grey and pink. There were pink boots as well, <laughs> like it just get even better. Um, there, there was her, it was her picture, her story. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and that just kind of completed the story for us, and we were handing out the strips at the end. So appreciative, so appreciative that they won't take anything from you without bowing and saying thank you. You know, I couldn't, as they say in Cambodia and Khmer, and um, and that just makes you feel even better because you know it wasn't just something flung at and just took it and left. And as a as a final moment, and we were standing in the pitch and we're watching all these kids leave at the end, and here you are, thousands of miles from home. And all these wee kids with football boots, Celtic tops, all sorts of tops, Rosville tops, you name it, strips from all over the world, just walking away, football boots, football, walking out into the streets of, streets of Cambodia. And I'll probably we'll may never see them again, but it was a beautiful moment. And they were a wee size seven. Is that right? There you go. There you go. There you go. That's, mag- that's the magic of the number seven. And um, it, I just think it's a fantastic story. And, and and I've actually been going through it in, in my head, visualising everything that was happening. But I I think you guys went over there and done a done a great job. So collectively, it's 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 everybody, it's everybody, and that's uh, he, he, the good thing about Jimmy Jimmy Johnson's charitable trust. It's about togetherness. From the outside looking in, I I can see how communities can pull together to make a difference, PJ, but. We, we get caught up in the modern day football and the glitz and the glamour and the broadcasting deals and the money and all that kind of stuff. How powerful can football actually be? I don't think there's any words that can describe how powerful football can actually be. You know, one moment of kindness changed another person's 3,000 miles away's life. And whether it was just an hour of enjoyment of playing football... You don't know what that knock-on effect's going to be. Will that wee girl remember that moment? 
Will she then want to be involved in football for longer and will she then impact somebody else over in Cambodia with football? People say you can't change the world, you know. But one act of kindness, I think, knocks on another act of kindness. Well, the, on the first year when we went over, um, the sponsors went over under the banner of Football for Change. And just what you're saying there, Paul, you know, football has such a powerful impact on on many, many things. Um, more so than politicians, more so than... Um, corporations and it's the small things like that that are massive I don't think you could buy that No, absolutely not So talk to us about some of the other experiences uh, whilst you were over there PJ Yeah look we, we had incredible amount of different types of experiences you know we had the kind of stories we've kind of spoke about the heartfelt moments but there were so many unreal moments that you couldn't have imagined and hilarious moments as well and we kind of said yesterday the things that made us laugh were ridiculous at times but we're sitting there thinking we'd always finish it with Jimmy would find this absolutely hilarious wouldn't he? He would have loved this and uh, so one of the ones is uh, we got a phone call from from Casho again and he was like um, how would you like to be VIP guests at the the Cambodian national team game they're playing Singapore Singapore yeah. and he um, said oh Absolutely, that would be fantastic. So he gave us the details to kind of to come meet him, etc. And like we said before, they're, they're crazy for their football. Absolutely, create eighty thousand sellout. Love it. And um, so we eventually got out to the, the, the stadium, and Casho came out to meet us. He's, he's a big hug, and you think we'd known this guy for years, but as Graham said, he's one of the one of these nice people that you meet in life. Introducing, he says, "Look," he said. Um, it's actually turned into a bit more of a, a kind of bigger VIP night than I kind of realised. We were like, okay, all right, no problem. We're in the Jimmy Johnston case, ah, no, no problem. So he took his out, he said, I've got a few people I'd like you to meet. He says, so this is, um, this is such and such. Now this guy had just signed a multi-million deal with Manchester City to bring Manchester City out. He said, owned the biggest beer company in, in Cambodia. Massive landowner that had a six foot nine bodyguard, armed bodyguard with them. Um, uh, we had the, the kid. and and an absolutely gorgeous bird. <laughs> 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 we had uh, the king's personal secretary. We get introduced to him, and then the last one he says we'd also like to introduce you. This is the prince of Cambodia. We just kind of looked at each other. I was like, okay, and you know, you're kind of bowing. You're like, oh, it's it's really nice to it's really nice to meet you. He's like, no, no. He says. Um, I remember you last year, We I came to the National Stadium to watch you coach, you were very, very good. I said, you were obviously watching Graham then, you weren't watching me. But um, and we were like that, Prince of Cambodia. So he's like, come on, we'll head out onto the, up to the, the seats. So if you picture Celtic Park with the, the emergency bit they've got for uh, an emergency vehicle to get in and then walking across the main stand. And then we turn, we see the, the bit that's kept for the King and Queen. And the, the prince is like, oh, after you, after me. We're like, no, 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 after you, after you. And so we are kind of walking along at the back, kind of looking at each other, thinking, this is mental. So we're halfway up, about an 80,000 crowd there, and all of a sudden you hear, oh, check you two out heading up to the prawn sandwich by grey day. Eh? We just kind of looked at each other like, what? And there it is, there was an Irish guy called Porig that we had met last year. P- Porig. <laughs> The year before, I had uh, ran the Homeless World Cup in George Square. I was the director, technical director for it. And Porig had come over with the Cambodian national team. <laughs> I mean, we got chatting away as he do Irish. What are you doing over in Cambodia? I mean, Irish. And so he gave us his story and whatever. So, ah, great, brilliant. So next thing we see him. We're up in this uh, direct, director's box, or, or not yeah. so much the, the, the royal, royal, the royal, royal box, box. Yeah. the royal box, and the old porry comes running up and slaughtering us <laughs> for the prawn sandwiches. <laughs> so, you know, you, you couldn't you couldn't actually uh, write that one. But the, the 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 most important, or not the most important, the most bizarre one for me was at the the end of the game. The game finished two one to Singapore or whatever. Yeah. I think in the first half. Um, Cambodia went 1-0 up and it was quite a good game quite a good game but it finished 2-1 to, to Singapore so that's fine so we're, we're sitting and uh, just waiting to okay what happened next where do we go whatever blah 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 and uh, one of the guys comes up and he says um, uh, we're going to take you down to meet the players 
So I thought he was talking about the prince and stuff like that and whatever, and we'd be tagging on at the end. So that's fine. So we, we, we stand out in the pitch for a while, just chatting away to the the biggest landowner and the biggest uh, um, mil- multi-millionaire and, and the prince, as you do. And uh, this guy says, like, okay, so it must have been about 20 minutes, half an hour later, okay, and you come now. So just at that, Singapore team comes out, bang on their bus, and the uh, Cambodian team comes out. One of the guys stops them, says whatever, back into the dressing room, you're going to be meeting the royal party or whatever. So we're back into the dressing room, and just at that, I get thrust to the front to say, is there anything you would like to say to, to the team? <laughs> what? He says, I'll let give them a few words of encouragement or whatever. Now, just to let you know, the the manager, this, this, is a, this is a cracker, the manager of the team was a guy called Honda. The guy called Honda played for Japan in the World Cup the previous year. Don't know if you remember him, but the blonde, blonde hair played for, for Japan, whatever. And um, he had two assistants and they were Argentinian. So here's a, the here's a deal. The guy Honda was in Australia, but he was doing his team talks by Skype into the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> he only came to games which were big games. He didn't bother about the, the friendlies or whatever. He just left his two assistants to go on with the friendlies. But whilst, uh, before the game at halftime, the big telly would be up in, in, in the, uh, the dressing room and Honda would be giving it this, that and the next thing. So I'm thinking, hey, wow, that's the way to go, eh? So um, the players are all sitting around. I just thrust to the front. Anything you'd like to say, there's an interpreter there or whatever. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. Now, bear in mind, this is about half ten or eleven o'clock at night. These guys are only full time, so they've been working all day. Well, you want to see the look the two Argentinian coaches were giving me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, obviously, I didn't want to do or say anything, but I fe- felt rude not to do it. So, um, by the time we got, to, I was saying, ah, oh, the boys did well and stuff like that, good young team, and time that got translated over and whatever, the eyes get even more and more glaring right into the side of my head. I want to go home. <laughs> I, they just wanted to get out of the road, whatever, and quite rightly so, I would, I, would, I would be the same, listening to this Egypt for Scotland coming over and whatever, but it was because they said we were from uh, the Jimmy Johnson Academy that uh, they felt that uh, we were able to impart some knowledge. So, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and then from that, so Cashel was, with his chauffeur, was driving us home back to the hotel that night. And uh, he actually said to us, have, have you ever, have you seen the palace? And he said, um, no, we hadn't, we hadn't had the chance to do that yet. And he says, no problem at all. He says, um, leave that with me. I'll, I'll maybe give you a phone later on tonight. Absolutely fantastic. So he dropped his off, brilliant, away he went. Phone goes about a couple of hours later. He says, look, he says, I've spoke to the, the King's personal secretary. He's going to give you a personal tour of the palace tomorrow. Jimmy Johnson Academy will be guests at the palace tomorrow. Fantastic. He says, um, you just meet and meet us at nine o'clock at the front gates. And says, yeah, that's absolutely no problem. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Next morning comes out. Of course, all I had was the black shirt. Black trousers, it's 100 degrees already by 8 o'clock in the morning, so we're, we're suited and booted. Sweat's pouring off is by the time we kind of get down there about 9 o'clock, um, before 9 o'clock. Um, 9 o'clock comes and goes, quarter past 9, I'm like, look, maybe we should phone Cashel just to see. We're a wee bit worried just in case, don't like the gentleman thinking we're rude, we're not here or anything like that. So, phone Cashel and Cashel's like, yeah, just give me a second. I'm actually in a bit of a big diplomatic meeting right now. Give me a second. So we're killing ourselves laughing. You think there's this big diplomatic crisis going on and here's Cashwell saying, guys, I've just got to nip out. I've got PJ and JD on the phone here. I'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> so so eventually he, he makes the call, etc. And um, a few things happened. But we only kind of get in there. Probably eventually he can run out about half ten. And, uh, and he's full of apologies, takes us round um, the, the palace he takes us into a couple of rooms that only is reserved for VIP guests. Very, very, a big honour to kind of be taken into the rooms that we're taken in. And almost kind of out of nowhere, he, he just turned to us and he says, I have a personal message for you from the Queen of Cambodia. We just kind of looked at each other like, okay. He says, 
She would personally like to thank you for the work in the Jimmy Johnston Charitable Trust has done for the children of Cambodia. She would like me to express her gratitude for you for that. And we just kind of, oh, no, no, you're, you're very welcome, you're very welcome. And, and we just, we just kind of looked at each other and it probably wasn't until later on where we actually took that in and thought, because then he just kind of carried on the tour after we actually thought, the Queen of Cambodia, you know, has just thanked us. It's just thanked Jimmy Johnston for coming to Cambodia. And he followed that up with, no, it's, it's a pity you're not here next week because we've got Princess uh, Beatrix are coming over and you could have met her and, and joined the banquet that she was here for. <laughs> well, oh, that would have been brilliant. Um, but it, it was just so surreal when you talk about Jimmy Johnston's stories. I mean, did you ever think the Queen of Cambodia would be thanking Jimmy Johnston? Jinky so. would, would have loved that. The Queen of Cambodia. <laughs> the Queen of Cambodia. Oh. And the King of the Jungle. And it, the Queen of Cambodia <laughs> meets the King of the Jungle. There you go. All that's left for me to say is PJ Corr and Graham Diamond, thank you for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind. No, look, Paul, thanks again for having us. It's been a real privilege and we've, we've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you don't mind, I just would take one last chance. Just This is the best chance we've kind of had to thank everyone and for everyone that donated, whether it was a pair of football boots, a pair of football socks, everyone that helped us along the way and it's, it's so much appreciated and I wish I wish everyone could have experienced what we got to experience and obviously a, a personal from me and Graham to, to Jim and to everybody at the, the Jimmy Johnston Charitable Trust we could not have done it without you and as Graham said before that there will never be enough words to say thank you so to everyone once again thank you very much and Paul thank you very much for having us on it's been absolutely fantastic absolute pleasure from this end thanks PJ